So if I look like I forgot where I was, that's why. <laughs> A little slow this morning, but I still hear the voice of the Lord saying something very clearly this morning. The certainties of the faith, the certainties of the faith in 1 John chapter 5. I write this to you who believe in adherence to, trust in, and rely on the name of the Son of God and the particular service and blessings conferred by Him on men, so that you may know with settled and absolute knowledge. So you already have life, yes, eternal life. And this is the confidence, the assurance, and the privilege of boldness which we have in him. We are sure that if we ask anything, make any request according to his will, in agreement with his own plan, which is his word, he listens and he hears us. And if since we positively know that he listens to us in whatever we ask, we also know with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted us as our present possession the requests made of him. That doesn't mean sometime in the future. That doesn't mean when our circumstances agree with the word of God. It means the minute we make our request to God, it is finished. It is done. We speak the word and it is. And I've been thinking a lot about the, the, what Nathan said a couple, or I think it was a couple Sundays ago about um, the Lord of the Rings quote. Will all the bad things become undone? We have such, and, and we watched this ridiculous movie called Lucy about this woman who used 100% of her brain. It was the stupidest movie I think I've ever seen, but <laughs> the point was <laughs> in the very end, she reached 100% of her brain power and she disappeared, but yet she was everywhere. And I think that's what God wants us to understand. We have disappeared, but we are everywhere. Yes. When we are limited to time, and that was the whole point, she said that the only reason we see, the only reason we exist and we see this one moment is because time constrains it. And at 100%, she was beyond the limits of time. Our God is beyond the limits of time. Our God is beyond the limits of circumstance. We see a snapshot of this compressed <coughs> moment. <coughs> But in eternity, you know, I, I, I always think um, I, there's a man from, I think, from Iowa, somewhere, Glenwood, Iowa, who had a, an experience, a near, a, a near death experience where he went to heaven and came back, and he talked about what he saw in heaven, and he talked about how everything was, blue was bluer, red was more red, the gold of the pavement of the streets was so much more than the shiny, weighty gold, everything was more beautiful, everything was more vibrant, color was more colorful, smells were more smelly. I mean, everything was more. And he said he was looking at this flower, and he wanted to, he wanted this flower, and so, you know, the Lord told him, well, pick it. Well, so he plucked the flower, and the flower was in his hand and still in the ground at the same time. Nothing is impossible with our God, and we are so limited to our understanding that we think it has to be one or the other. We think it has to be one or the other, but it doesn't. It simply is. And when, um, Oh, there's another quote I heard that um, something about the pursuit of happiness and the journey. And when the journey is the pursuit, happiness is. Yeah. And so I think that sometimes, like I know personally, those obstacles or those roadblocks, yeah. do I ask amiss? Like I keep going back to, do I ask yeah. the Lord amiss? Do I ask for a solution to the problem? Or do I ask him to pluck the root of the problem out of my life? Do I ask for wisdom? If I have a health issue, is there something in my life that I'm doing that brings it back recurring? If I have a financial issue, am I lacking wisdom in some area and making poor choices? There is a root that the enemy knows <laughs> and loves to come in and remind us of how, how short we fall, right? When we get that little breakthrough, when God starts to reveal his word, when the circumstance starts to change, the enemy comes in to remind you. Ooh, this root isn't gone. See, this is tender. I can push this and it hurts and you yeah. fall and you complain and you whine and, and nothing changes. Right. We, that is the moment when we just say, God, it's yeah. finished. Yeah. It is finished. I don't care what I feel. I don't care what I see. I don't care what I say. I don't care what others say. I don't care what the circumstances around me say. Your word is true. Yeah. And the minute I asked you, I now thank you because yeah. it is finished. Yeah. It is finished. We yeah. have received it as a present right. possession. Yeah. A present possession. A present possession. That's not in the future. 
you know, and, and I just, everybody's testimonies have been so powerful and I appreciate every testimony. Why are we here, right guys? Why are we here if not to change things? You know, I, I just listened, I'm um, getting caught up in all the messages where I've been downstairs with the kids. King me, are you kinged? Do you have freedom to move around and to force the enemy back? Not only in our own lives, but in the lives of people around us. You are powerful. You are a king and a priest in this world, a representative of Jesus Christ. You are one with him. There is no difference. There's no difference. But we have to see ourselves. And we look to him, and it just flows. So we need to go back. When the root of our own flesh rises up, we go back to the root of the vine. Yes. And suddenly, it all changes. Yes. When we look up instead of at the circumstance, when we continue to look to him and his word and focus on that, suddenly, it all works itself out. Yes. The problems become small. They don't bother us as much. They, nothing may have changed, but everything changed. Yes. We need to remember that everything changed the minute we make our petition. Yes. And we can just peace, yeah. hold our peace, um, worship God. And look for those around us that need to hear the grace of God, that you are loved, that you have a precious destiny to know Jesus Christ, to represent him to those in your lives. Every single one of us, oh, let's change this world. Let's change this world and let it begin with us. Let it begin in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. your testimonies this morning. James. Well, I have uh, quite a testimony. Some lady, I, hmm, um, I'm trying to think what it is. Indiana or Wolverine or something like that. Uh, I met her at the trail one day. The race and I met her at the trail show because I met Greg. And this lady heard about me why Sherry just was so powerful. Well, she got it and <coughs> had it encouraged in me to break the habit of me drinking too much soda. And I had told this lady about God replenishing me in my heart. And when this lady heard that I started drinking that Sherry juice, it encouraged her. And when she talked to me that night, she picked me up at the work and took me home. That gives a light to you, James, and God uses you to a lot of people. And I said, Well, I said, That's the way our church is that we open up to express God's words to others. And all we have to do is listen. And I tell you, I never got so close to God other than Friday night to come out there just right on Euclid and walking home. Met this guy named Dave, and he must have been a Christian. We were out here looking out in the river, and there's this bald eagle. And it's out there soaring in the distance, and it, you always see an eagle. It's always a revelation of God. And you see that thing up in the air with those wings flapping like, like just carry you Lord, where up? And I thought of that, and lo and behold, again, the next thing I know, it started diving. It dived in the water. And I suppose it grabbed a fish, but I couldn't see that closely. But to see that thing dive in the water, to come back up and get a fish, like, do we have enough of God, or do we need to really look up in the heavens like an eagle? Do we really need to really, just to really encourage others what God has in store? That's what I feel like when I see an eagle. And that is Amen. very strong for me. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, I was uh, just cooking my thing yesterday. Uh, and I was kind of sitting at home by myself and wanting to fellowship. And I thought of a friend down at the Y. And I thought, well, it's Saturday. He's probably working. And when I was there, he was. Sure enough, he was working. 
sitting there watching the watching the games on the TV and fellowshipping, and it was so awesome. I just like Lord, I was driving home and, and the Lord said, you know, this this is your ministry. Mm -hmm. You know, these these people. And I I see you know what I've been there and I've seen what they have and I've seen the need and you know it was just so awesome just to sit there and I didn't preach to them I didn't share scripture or anything I just I just did a prayer Hallelujah and it was so awesome and when I got home the Lord the Lord said you're He's done it for one of these He's done it for me.
Come on. And she was dead. Right? Right. 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 Come on. So I'm saying our word supersedes, the word of God supersedes right. over anything. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm, I can preach right now. Come on. I'm saying God's got this under control, and that's yeah. where I'm going to stay focused. Right. So yeah. if we can continue to just, that healing is manifest yeah. in the body. Hallelujah. It's Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Remembering Jesus wept when he heard Lazarus had died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He knew he was coming back to life, but he wept because he had a moment, right? Yeah. We're, it's okay. We feel those things. Yeah. We feel them. That's not, a, that's not a sin. That's not lack of faith. It's facing circumstances. It's seeing the hurt on people around us, but that doesn't mean Lazarus didn't come out of the tomb right. and live a life. Right. You know, that's, we, yeah, I yes. agree. Amen. I stand with you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
sure we all have those doubts during that time, but that's what we need to come back to mm -hmm. is God's word. Yes. Yes. And it's always been in the beginning God. Yes. And, and God is there for the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. He was there when we was born. He was there before we was in our mom's belly. He was there and he was already weaving our personality. Yeah. He knows all about us. He knows what things got in the world, the more excited I got, because that means something so good is right around the corner. I, we're very young in my walk with the Lord. I heard a Jesse Duplantis teaching, which is kind of silly, but um, anybody that knows Jesse Duplantis, he's kind of silly, but um, he talked about your blessings are on layaway. I don't know if anybody ever heard that teaching, but the enemy has, he's a spirit. He knows, and he knows when God's getting ready to pour out a blessing, and boy, he comes in like a flood to get you in a position where you can't receive it, or where you just stop asking for it or believing for it. And so ever since then, I've always thought, you know, it's so true. It's the darkest right before the sun rises. It is the darkest, so chaotic, you know, right before that sun rises. And so the heftier the pews get, the more excited I get, because something God's going to pour out a blessing here that's going to knock our socks off, the worst, the worst our circumstances get. I get excited, because God is working and the enemy is mad. Why else would he bother to mess with us so much? Because our blessing is coming. Our blessing is being released. So I'm telling you guys, when it gets ugly, when you get frustrated, start rejoicing because your blessing is on its way. It's on its way. so vivid. I could 
could see it all. And the thing that was so amazing was the calm. I had absolute calm in the thick of all these people. And I thought, they're going to kill me. They want to kill me. But the, the I, I thought, this is what the disciples had when it came. You know, you wonder, how in the world could Peter say, oh, no, don't just crucify me. Do it upside down. Yeah. You know, I mean, they were not afraid. And he said, I'm going to have to put off this tabernacle. Anyhow, I pondered that thing for it has not left me over and over. What is it all about? So I've, got, I've talked to the Lord. I've talked to him. I've talked to him. I can't get anything. But then finally, the word terror came to me. So Jane and I looked it up, tried to get every definition of terror. Because, you know, I thought, it's just, it's just wait. But it's to wait in a particular place. Saul was told to tarry for Samuel. Wait, don't do anything. Wait. And the Lord said, just a little longer. That's all he told, just a little longer. That we have to endure this. What's going on? And it's not only in us. But I I'll tell you what. We, we haven't begun to conceive what God's going to do in this last day. <coughs> See, our minds can't comprehend it. We can't. And I, I told Jane, I said, I feel like it's, we're on a need-to-know basis. We don't know everything because the enemy has a way of getting information out of us. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have it until we absolutely need to know it, he can't get it out of us. That's right. Right. But all that's going on, both personally and around the world, when we see it, is nothing but Daniel 12 coming to life yep. and all the other prophecies. Mm -hmm. See, we our flesh says, oh, making more out of this. You know, you're more out. And then every time something like we pray for Evie, and all the news keeps bad, yeah. bad, bad. See, we can't comprehend the army that's trying to hold all this. Right. It's like, when there's a crack in it, though, it will crumble. Right now, he's having a heyday, but he's expending every ounce of yeah. evil he's got to yeah. keep this thing in the state it's in. Evie and all the people like that that we pray for and we and it seems like where are you God? He's there all the time. Yes. And we've got to believe that. Yes. Well, we don't have to believe it. It is fact whether we believe it or not. That's right. You know, uh, I, I fought so many times when Jesus went to Nazareth and he could do so few things. It came to me just out of the blue that the reason he could do it, we said, well, because of their unbelief. But because of their unbelief, they've made no demands on him. That's right. In order to demand, yeah. uh, make a demand on him, like the little woman that crawled through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment, and he felt it. Yeah. And they said, well, you've been bumped and knocked around. But he said, no, this was different. Yeah. Someone yeah. made a demand on me. Yeah. Someone needed something, yes. and they touched me. Yes. Yeah. And the problem, Jody, and I think so many times, I don't mean to say this in a bad way, but we need to take everybody that doesn't know where we're coming from Amen. out of the room yep. and go in there yep. and then make a demand yes. on the Lord. Come on. But unbelief is the only thing that stopped Jesus from yes. doing this. Yes. Yes. And it, it wasn't because he couldn't. How right. foolish to think that right. he couldn't have done miracles there, but they didn't ask for any. Right. And I think so many times we wonder why he doesn't do miracles. We don't ask for him. Yeah. We're willing to accept what goes on. We've got to really get serious about yeah. this. I, I'm talking to myself now. This is, this is, we're coming into the battle of the, of all eternity. And God has put us here for this reason. At this time. Not by accident. Which one of us had one thing to do with being born? None of us. We're here. It's appointed. And it's time to understand that we have a destiny. Every one of us. God put us here for this time. We may leave this place and go all over the world from here. But you know what? This is the building time. That's this right. is when we get anchored yes. and grounded. <laughs> and when we know that we know yes. he will not fail. He won't. He won't. That's right. But as long as we let the enemy... Again, I am not talking to anyone but myself. Jane and I discuss these things all the time. He comes at us from 
every direction. Yeah. Money, sure. health, you mm -hmm. name it. Yeah. He's, a, he's got tricks for everything. Yeah. That's right. But we have to believe. Yes. Yeah. Listen, God's word is forever settled. That's right. yeah. That is all we need to know. That's all that we've got to harbor and take and bury yeah. down inside to where he can't get it. His word is forever settled. Every yes. promise. He can't. St I don't care what it looks like. That's right. And yet my flesh, I'd be a liar if I sat here and said, oh, I don't <coughs> stagger at times. And, you know, I, I think, Lord, where are you? Where are you? But then we stop and we think, no, we know where you are. Yes. You're right here. Right. You will yes. never leave us nor forsake us. Right. I don't know. I could go on and on, but we all could. And I think that's important that we yes. all pour our hearts out yes. and tell each other, that, yes. hey, I'm struggling. Yes. I want yes. to keep my head above water. And yes. I need you and you yes. and I need yes. everybody yes. to lift me up. That's right. And I'll do my part to try to yes. lift you up. Yes. But it's all Jesus. That's right. I mean, this isn't a cake. This is more real than any of us. Right. That's right. Yes. He is, we are coming up. This is what we've all heard all our lives, and yeah. we're on the brink. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 And, and uh, yeah. Amen. Immediately when you shared your vision, I thought of Psalm 23. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, Woo. and thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over yeah. me. Yes. Not only are you going to stand, right. you're going to banquet with the yeah. Lord. And your yeah. joy has more power than that entire army of That's people. Right. All of the hate in the world, all of the hate that exists. Yes. One yeah. moment where our joy, our joy is more, is a strength. And it is the Lord's strength that he has given us. Yes. He fills our cup to overflow. Yes. And that oil of gladness, yeah. oh, I'm telling you, can we, I mean, that, that's what blows my mind, is not only are we going to stand, we're going to feast, and we're going to rejoice yeah. with all of that around us. And Psalm 91 says, it can't even come near your house. Right. Not just near you, but your whole house. Right. It can't come near you. That's it. That blows my mind. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? All right, let's stand and go to the Lord this morning. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you are always with us, Lord. That you never leave us, you never forsake us. You are faithful, Lord. That when you hear our petitions, Lord, oh, that it is finished. Oh, we thank you, Jesus, that you have come and finished the work of the Father in this world forever. It is settled forevermore. And when we agree, when we stand on your word, it must. It already has come to pass, Lord. And we will stand. And speak your word and believe with our whole hearts, Lord, that it is finished, Lord. The healing power of your blood, Jesus, still flows today, Lord. Raising the dead, Lord. Healing the sick. Opening the blind eyes. Opening the deaf ears, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that every disease that comes upon this body, Lord, is finished. It is healed from the root, Lord. From Adam to the end, Lord. It is finished. We have been redeemed. I thank you, Lord, that you restore what has been stolen, what the locust has eaten, Lord, that you restore the finances, the relationships, Lord. You restore all things and make them new, Lord, that you make all things new, Lord. So we thank you that you work it out, Lord, that you have prepared the way. We must simply walk in it, Lord. Simply walk in it and trust you, Lord. Follow after you. Jesus, that your word is a light unto our feet, Lord. Let your word lead us and guide us in boldness, Lord. Fearing nothing. Lord, as we share testimonies of your grace, testimonies of that our joy of our cup running over, Lord, let it splash into the lives of those around us, Lord. Of you this morning, that you are great and mighty. You have overcome the world. That you have overcome the world. What can stand in our way, Lord? Oh, hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, what 
can stand in our way, Lord. You have overcome the world, that you have already made the way. You know the end from the beginning, Lord. If we will but stand, oh, hallelujah, that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us, Lord. Strengthen your people, Lord. Oh, fill our cups to overflowing with the joy that comes from the confidence knowing you, Lord, that your grace is unfailing, that your grace is more than enough, that you are more than enough, Lord. Jesus, give us wisdom and revelation in the depths of your grace, Lord, to walk in your ways, Lord, to share and to transform this world for your kingdom, for your glory. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Jesus. Uh, this Friday, Eastern Gate House of Prayer, 7 o'clock. Anybody who wants to come for just a little bit or for the whole time, we'll be meeting. Um, usually uh, we plan from 7 to 9. Sometimes it's a little shorter, sometimes it's a little longer. The Lord will lead. Yeah, um, it's just not just about the worship team coming together. Even as it's been spoken a couple times already this morning, it takes a whole body. If you can make it, it's not so much for to fill the place up or whatever, but there are specific things the Lord wants to speak through people in this right. place to bring forth revelation. There are things, there are people that are missing this morning that had things on their heart that the Lord wanted to share through them this morning, and unfortunately they're not here this morning. Each of you who are here, I really appreciate it because you all had something to bring forth into the banqueting table. Um, it's almost like a Holy Ghost potluck. The Lord's throwing this on me right now. It's like a Holy Ghost potluck. I mean, what is it when somebody just brings in a salad and, and, and every and a couple of other people just bring a salad? Where, where, where's, where's this banqueting table at? But you all brought in dessert. Some brought in steak. Stuff like that. So I appreciate it when you are here. Amen. Let's pray for those yes, that are not able to be with us this day yes, to Lord. be providing and, and have a way to be here because they have things to bring onto that banqueting table. And Amen. I'm full. I mean, we had church right here this morning. And, yeah. and uh, this is part of what's going on. If you can come and help bring something to that table, <coughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I know there's going to be more prayers coming and <clears throat> prayer times coming, and it's not up to me to delegate or designate or anything else. It's, it's up to the Holy Ghost. But I've seen uh, a week ago, uh, and then it was progressive for three nights. I, I couldn't stop it in the middle of the night. It was just getting continually woke up about revival, about revival, about revival. I'd be dead asleep, wore out from work, but I keep getting woke up in situations of revival and stuff. <clears throat> but most of the time, revival. <laughs> Uh, even the Hebrides revival and things like that. Uh, it started with two ladies, two old ladies. One that was physically handicapped. She was bent over. She couldn't leave her house, and her sister was blind. And the Lord used these two ladies to change a nation. All right? They changed a nation. All the Lord is asking for is, where is your hunger? Where Are you hungry? Are you hungry? And I saw someone in here every night, one person, two people, every night through the week, just not being a burden, but just wanting to be in the presence of the Lord, just wanting to stand in the gap. The Lord's presence is here right now. And then we go to the highways and the byways and go to our homes and our situations and our life. And, and it's not like the Lord is not with us, but he wants to manifest himself yeah. here. Yeah. And what he wants is someone to sit here with him when we're not here. Am I wrong, Peter? No. What, what's the Lord speaking to you about right now? You want to know everything? <laughs> well, we're having church, so okay. whatever. All right, so I'm, I'm a very, I'm always oriented on the goal. And lately in my life, I've been very discouraged because I just turned 44 years old. Sally and I have the best birthday of the two of us. Yeah. And, um, I just turned, and I looked at what I had and hadn't accomplished in my life. And the Lord Seems like yesterday I was in high school or the day before I was in, in a 
said, Arthur is not our friend. He said, Lord, Lord is our friend. You know, am I sharing Jesus with others? Am I encouraging others? Am I doing things that, that God finds pleasing? Am I touching other people's lives? But the most important thing was the fact that his was about his friendship with God. And even though he had been he had known the Lord for 40 years, he felt like, you know, that that was nothing compared to really knowing the Lord. And so that's where my life has, has changed. I've been very task oriented on things that I had to accomplish every day. That's just how my work is, that's how my mind is. And now I'm focusing more on am I spending time with Jesus? You know, if, if I'm alone in the car, do I want to listen to something on the radio or do I want to take that time to talk to the Lord? Because I have a great relationship with the Lord many years ago. But when I got a I mean, we still don't have the best cars, but when I had a car that this radio didn't work because I would take that time and purposefully seek God and talk to God whatever I was doing. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem is, is too many Christians only talk about God when they're around other people to gain notoriety or get attention. When really what God really cares about is when you're alone with him, what, what's in your car seat. Amen. So I, I agree with everything Mike's saying, but that's where God, that's where God's brought me peace because I've been really frustrating because frustrated because I'm not where I believe God's plan for my life is, but my focus has always been on what I'm doing or not doing for God, not on the time I'm spending not with Him. Amen. 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 Speak of the bank when he said it. Yeah. Bum, ba, dum, ba. <laughs> uh, we are going to do a soup and salad uh, dinner on March 22nd, right after the service. There's a sign-up sheet on the back on the clipboard, so if you'd like to come and share a meal and time of fellowship, um, sign up to bring something, a soup or a salad or a dessert or a beverage or place settings or anything like that, feel free to sign up in the back. We'd love to share some, break some bread and share some time of fellowship with each of you. And if you don't feel like we were able to bring anything, it doesn't matter. Come yeah, anyway. Come yeah. Come enjoy our, there's, yeah. there's always plenty. Yeah. Yep. Amen. Amen. And speaking of the two sisters, isn't that where the scripture came from? Yeah. Isn't this from that story? Yeah. That's where the scripture came from. Mike talked yeah. about the two sisters that started the revival. Yeah. This was their heart prayer. This was the scripture that they meditated on that really yeah. resounded with us. And that's why we added the scripture to our, um, to our lineup, I guess. So let's speak the word this morning. Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Yes, Lord. the curse of the law, therefore I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease germ and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which I created to function, and I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. Lord. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Um, Don and uh, Toby, do you guys want to come take the... Don, can you grab... I'll give John the morning off. Sorry, yeah. Toby, you want to ask a blessing this morning, please? Lord, we're thankful for your good grace. We call you our King and Savior. Lord, as King, you declared your word, and it went out as law. It is unlawful for your people to have affliction come against them. Your word declares that we are the head, not the tail. That all our relations to God are in you that are perfect. That our bodies function to the perfection in which they should be. 
We don't uh, have communion on a regular basis, and not because it's not a good thing to do, it's just that it can become a ritual. And I hope everybody here knows by now that you all can take communion anytime. Take it in your own home, take it with your family, uh, wherever you are, you're, you're a king and a priest, and you have the right to. what some call the sacraments. But, uh, when you take communion, and we're going to take it before we worship this morning because that way when we get into worship, you can celebrate what God's doing for you. Uh, you know, the scripture talks about how that having taken the communion when Jesus was, was uh, explaining it to his disciples, he told them that uh, this cup is the New Testament in his blood. Now, the New Testament is the gospel, and the gospel is grace. So salvation, healing, prosperity, deliverance, revelation, breakthrough, all of these things come by the same means, by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, which is the finished work of Christ. So you have, you have every right, just as it was spoken today, to expect and demand. That's not, I know that sounds uncomfortable in some religious ways, but that's what God tells us to do. Place a demand on the anointing. The anointing comes through the grace of God. So whatever your need is here this morning, maybe it's multiple. Maybe you need healing. Maybe you need a financial breakthrough. Maybe you need revelation. We all need all these things, if not all at the same time, certainly at different times in our lives. So God's saying, show your your belief in him, your confidence in him by placing a demand on the finished work. So this isn't just taking some grape juice and a cracker. We're remembering what Jesus did on our behalf. And he said every time we do this, we'll read the scriptures here in a moment, but he said every time we do it, remember him. Remember what he's done. Because it's through remembering that that we access the manifestation of what he's done. Amen? cross at the cross where I first saw the light <laughs> they were rolled away it was there by faith I received my sin and now I am happy 
When Jesus told his disciples uh, to participate in this as often as you do it, so you can do it as often as you want. And uh, I, as again, again, I just, I just don't want to turn it into a ritual and uh, have us just kind of, well, it's what we do on a certain Sunday of the month. But we need to be doing it. You need to do it in your own home. You need to do it with your family. You need to do it in church. So as often as you do it, go do it remembering him. I said, I mentioned last week that when Jesus was at that wedding, he was there sipping that wine in this atmosphere of joy and uh, celebration. But he was thinking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's why he told Mary, it's not my time. He wasn't talking about it's not time for miracles. He's saying, my time is when I die, when I give my life. So he gives the wine, you know, and those earthen jars, which represented, in fact, the Bible tells us that they were, they were ritual cleansing jars that the Jews kept their, that they washed in before ritual. Jesus took the very thing that was between them and God and turned it into a festival poured wine and turned it into joy. And he's telling us, just like as he was in the midst of all this joy, thinking about the pain and the suffering that he was going to go through, he wants us in the midst of all of the mess that in the world, all the chaos, all the pain, all the suffering, to look to the joy that he's provided for us. Not only now, but for eternity. And that's what we do when we take communion. Communion. We remember what Christ has done for us, and we celebrate. It's not a sad thing. We need to be rejoicing. We need to be happy. We need to be expecting the miraculous, the supernatural. That's who we are. We are children of God. We are supernatural by birth. We just have to, as it was already said, we have to keep reminding ourselves, and this is one way that we do it. And so in 1 Corinthians, we'll just read this. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death. As often as you do it, you're showing the finished work of Christ. He says,
said, there's some sick among you, some even sleep. It's because you don't recognize what Christ is doing. You're not, you're not receiving what he's doing. It's not a ritual. It's a celebration of what God has provided for us. And even go even further and say that it's us not recognizing the Christ that's in each one of us. So when a testimony goes forth and you hear it, you think, ah, well, that's just so-and-so. No, that's Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. That's Christ speaking, and he's speaking to you. And if you don't recognize that, if you don't acknowledge it, it's just like you receive the prophet's blessing by believing the prophet. Paul said, I would that you all prophesy. So we're hearing prophecies. We're hearing testimonies. We're hearing the very voice of God come out of his body. And if you don't accept it with a sense of truth and viability, then you don't get any benefit from it, even though there's benefit for you. Praise the Lord. He's made all things good. Everything. Hallelujah. So let's celebrate what God's done already this morning. Praise the Lord. Thank you. worship set this morning, but I have to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. I know the word coming forth is for such a time as this. Well, I want to just celebrate his goodness and his faithfulness. Hallelujah. We're going to do one song as pastor comes forth to bring forth the word. We want to stay in that river. Lord, we want to stay in your river. Lord, yes. just manifest your presence. And you take over, Lord. Continue to take over this service. When pastor's done preaching the word, when he's done bringing forth the word, if, if you're still hungry, if you still want more, yeah, we can do worship after the word. We don't have an agenda. We don't have a schedule. All right? The Lord says, if you're hungry, I will feed you. If you thirst. So, if you want to stay after the word and worship some more, that's up to you. We'll leave the banqueting table over. We're not going to put everything away in the Tupperware dishes and throw them in the refrigerator, okay? Something's up, and I just want to be the end to the Lord, okay? One, two, ready, go. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let the earth rejoice, let the earth rejoice. 
Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. I believe God's done something. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Thank you, worship team. As Mike said, if you want to stay and worship a little longer, praise the Lord by all means. Feel free. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. Sunday school kids, you may be dismissed to go downstairs. And I'll just mention that uh, Sally got a text from uh, Sheila. Oh, I guess John's here. Uh, he could share with us. But um, she, she did say that the handkerchief we prayed for Wednesday night, uh, they felt really uh, like God had done something. She, she clutched it and held on to it and hugged it over her body uh, from the moment that Sheila gave it to her said the swelling had gone down, and she's going home Monday, I believe, right, John? She still is going to have some chemo and, and other issues, but uh, listen, it is finished. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's what, that's what we declare. It has nothing to do with age. Uh, I mean, I know sometimes you think, well, you know, they're 60 years old. Well, wait till you're 60. It won't seem so old then, I promise you. Praise the Lord. But uh, 70, 80, doesn't matter. We should live our life and die healthy. Just give up the ghost. Amen? Yes. When we're done, we're done. We can just lay down and say, move on from here. Praise the Lord. We don't have to live feeble and sickly and infirm just because we're over 70 years of age. Or 80 years of age, for that matter. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> you don't look like you believe me. I know you're looking at me, but that's not the point. You don't look at me. Look at Jesus. That's right. Amen? He told Moses, 120 years. Yes. I mean, we ought to be thinking 120. I don't care what the, the average lifespan is. I'm not average. I'm supernatural. Praise the Lord. So we ought to be believing, amen, for supernatural longevity in life and not just living a long time in this realm, but living healthy in this realm, enjoying the life. Amen? Now, we need to realize, too, that dying isn't, you know, really isn't a punishment. If we really believe everything we're saying and about God and about heaven and about Jesus, then, whoa, like Paul said, I'm, you know, this is a tough spot to be in because on the one hand, I want to go and be with the Lord. But on the other hand, I have an obligation to the people that are here. Well, that's the way we ought to all feel. Man, there's nothing greater than being with Jesus than being in heaven, being in eternity with no more pain, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more any of that. But on the other hand, there's people here that don't know what we know, that don't know the Jesus that we know. They may know about him, but they don't know him. And so uh, we want to hang around here till our work is finished. Praise the Lord. When it's done, go on and be with the Lord. Amen. Yes, he does. It, that just me of that. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. You. you know, that's what he says that, you know, there are instantaneous healings, obviously. Yes. If you think about it, every healing is instantaneous. Right. It's just the manifestation isn't always instantaneous. He says, and they were healed. Lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Yes. 
So sometimes it is the manifestation is immediate. Every healing is immediate because it was done 2,000 years ago. So it's already, it's not a question of it getting done, it's already done. But the way it manifests in the natural realm in time, sometimes it does it over gradually. You all heard my testimonies about hepatitis C and all that. It was over a year constantly getting those reports from the VA. Yeah, you're going to have to have a liver transplant, you know, this thing and that thing and all this stuff. And then one day they said, uh, you know, we can't find any. Come on. <laughs> if I didn't have all these records, they said, piled up on my desk of the tests and the liver scans and all this stuff over the last year, I'd have to say you never had it. Come on. Well, I never had it. Praise the Lord. I was healed in Jesus' name. And that's the way God works. So you just stay faithful and confess what God says about the situation. And it has to come to pass. His word has to come to pass. Our problem is that when you don't get the answer in 30 days, we we'll throw up our hands and start looking for an alternative. But there isn't any alternative. Amen. It's just that's the answer. Hallelujah. So just because doctors give up, you know, I know in the natural that's discouraging. But, hey, doctors never heal anybody anyhow. They fix the symptoms. They cover up the symptoms or they... You know, they, they can help you to heal, but they don't have the ability to heal. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. I'm not against doctors. I, you know, we go to doctors. But I'm saying doctors, they, they help your body to do what your body is supposed to do the way God created it. Right. Well, we read the scriptures all the time and confess them that uh, no, nothing in my body should act as though it weren't a perfect creation. You know, just because I live in a cursed world doesn't mean I have to participate in the curse. I've been delivered from the curse. So even though there's curses on the ground and there's curses on the humanity in general, just because of the world that we're in is fallen. We're not of this world. We are just happen to be in it. We're just passing through. So don't breathe on me, sinners. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, let's move on here quickly. Praise the Lord. I want to deal with this. We, we've all been talking about faith in different forms and different ways here this morning, so that's what I want to talk to you about as well. And let's, look at, let's, let's begin with Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Romans 4, 16 to begin with. We'll read another scripture out of Galatians and then a, a more lengthy scripture from John, and we'll try to put all this together in some way. Romans chapter 4, verse 16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. Praise the Lord. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Abraham was before the law. He represents all of us, every, everything that we have for an inheritance. And, and we even know that the Jews have to come by this the same way. You know, God's not done with the Jews, but even the Jewish uh, people, if they, the, the problem was they digressed in the way that the law was given. But the law, with all of the sacrifices, was still a faith act. You put your faith in the goodness of God or the grace of God that that sacrifice was going to be sufficient to cover your sin for another year. It wasn't ultimate, it wasn't perfect, but it was still an act of faith, and it was still grace that God was operating in. Because obviously, the person had no connection with that animal. The animal, you know, the, the, the animal was simply a sacrificial animal to cover the sins of that person. Right? right? So that's, so it's of faith so that it can be by grace. So nobody can take credit for it but Jesus, whatever it is, Right? All right, look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. So it's a faith that it might be by grace so that the promise can be sure. And that he might reconcile both God. No, I, I need uh, Galatians 2, 16. Right. 
knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus. Now, we just read that it's by faith so that it can be by grace, so that the promise can come about, right? So it's by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. All right, now let's go to John chapter 20, the Gospel of John chapter 20, and we're going to read verses 1 through 18. So it's a kind of lengthy, but it's so that you all probably know this story in and out, but we're going to look at it, break it down a little bit as we go. So the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark under the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. And they ran, and they cometh, excuse me, and they ran to get, okay, here we go. And they come, and then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now that word knew there is not, it wasn't that they didn't know that scripture, they didn't understand it. That word actually translates understand. So they didn't understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. As she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in the white sitting, in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Okay, so according to the scripture that we just read here, faith is both impossible and rational. Praise the Lord. Now, I don't mean it's impossible for anyone to have faith. I'm just saying that as a human, as fallen human beings, we are morally and spiritually flawed. We're dead. We're spiritually dead. I'm talking about unsaved humans. So nobody has within them the ability to produce faith in Christ. So then, faith is impossible for anybody without intervention or help. And to think about this, because before we come to the Lord, we didn't have faith. We were dead in our trespasses and our sins. Something had to initiate faith for us to even believe in God in the first place. Praise the Lord. So faith is impossible without intervention or without help. Now these scriptures that we just read, they're expressing this truth. Now keep in mind, Jesus had been telling his disciples over and over that he was going to die and then rise on the third day. I mean, over and over, just in the book of Mark. I'll show you three places just in the book of Mark. But it's, first of all, they had the whole Old Testament that was prophesying about this. But then, even in the New Testament, where Jesus is speaking directly face to face to these guys, he's telling them flat out. He's not, it's not hidden in a, in a prophecy or some vision or something. He's just saying flat out, this is what's going to happen. So, in, let's look at first in Mark chapter 8 and verse 31.
And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Those are, these are Jesus' words to his disciples. All right, then Mark 9, verse 31. Next chapter, verse 31. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he's killed, he shall rise the third day. Now this isn't a different gospel. This is within the same gospel. So this is at least twice in one man's documentation of this that Jesus spoke these things. All right, look at uh, chapter 10, verse 33 and 34. Saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him, and, they shall, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. Praise the Lord. Now, it, this was so well known, the teaching that Jesus was teaching in terms of his death, burial, and resurrection, that even his enemies knew about it. Because look at Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 through 66. Matthew 27, 62 through 66. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that, deceiver, that that deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He's risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So even the, the non-followers of Jesus were aware of his teaching of the death, the burial, and the resurrection, right? Now, despite all of this, Mary comes to the tomb, a follower of Jesus from the early days of his ministry. She comes to the tomb. She sees that the stone is rolled away. And immediately she runs back and says, they've taken the body. Mary would have heard Jesus teach this stuff right along with those disciples. She was there. She was with him. You know, she would have heard it. She would have known of the resurrection and heard of the death and burial and so forth as often as any of the disciples would have. So why, when she sees the empty tomb, doesn't she say to herself, oh, he said he was going to rise the third day. It doesn't even occur to her. And that's saying that belief in the person and the work of Christ doesn't come naturally to anybody. We can't produce saving faith in Jesus by our own ability. There is in every human being an inherent spiritual blindness it's what the scripture teaches. They can't see the truth. Eyes you have, but you see not. Right? Now here's the greatest act of redemption in history. Ever was, ever will be. God's breaking the power of sin and death through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They are seeing, I mean, they're, they're hearing this. They've been taught this, along with Jesus' teaching about the event and its meaning. And yet here's Mary staring right at it, staring right at the empty tomb, and yet she can't see it. She can't process it. So faith is impossible without supernatural intervention by God himself. Now that's true, not just saving faith. But I want you to think about the times when you have believed God for something miraculous. It doesn't come natural to just believe it, to just accept it. Even when you're born again, because you still got a flesh, you still got a natural mind, you still got a soul that reasons and does all these other things. Amen? So in ourselves, 
faith is impossible. Now look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 25 and 26. Now, this is after Jesus has been talking about it's easier for a rich man to enter into heaven than uh, to, to, it's either, how's it go? It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into heaven. Now, he only uses the rich man because the rich guy is who he's been talking to. But basically what he's saying, and the disciples pick up on it right away, this guy was a good guy. This rich guy, he kept all the commandments, he said. The only problem he had was he wouldn't give up everything to trust Jesus. Now, Jesus isn't asking you to give away all your money. He's just making a point here because the guy put it in the legal situation or circumstance. I've kept all these rules from my youth up. So Jesus is just going to show him, okay, now I'm going to give you something you can't do or won't do to show that no matter what you do, you're going to come short of God's demand of personal righteousness and holiness. Right? That's the context of that story. And the disciples are listening to all this, and they go, what? Who's going to be saved then? Because they know right away they got a problem. Yeah. Now remember, they're not saved. These are not saved people. This is still under the old covenant. But Jesus beheld them, or he heard what they were saying to themselves, and he said to them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Praise the Lord. So there's other things that we see in the scripture back in John chapter 20 of Mary coming to the tomb and the disciples and so forth. And that is that faith, although faith is impossible for man in and of himself, faith is rational. Praise the Lord. It's not just a rational process. It's a supernatural and personal encounter with Jesus. Praise the Lord. Christian faith is more than rational. Faith is based on evidence. And right here we have some of the best evidence, some of the most important evidence that the Bible offers. But why aren't Mary, John, and Peter camped out at the tomb around the clock waiting for the third day? We, we think of ancient people, we think of these 2,000 years ago cultures as being superstitious. And that's true to some degree. They had a lot of superstitions. They believed all sorts of claims about magic and miracles. Read about the Kabbalahs and these different gorums and, and different things that they believed, which were basically goblins and all kinds of strange creatures that could be really big. And, you know, they had superstitions. Miracles, supernatural beings and powers that we don't believe in today. Even as Christians, I mean, we, we know what we believe that is supernatural, but there's a lot of hocus pocus and junk out there that we don't believe. It. It's just that. It's just superstition. So we reckon that Jesus' followers, because of that mindset, because of that kind of cultural way of thinking, they would have been gullible. Right? They would have been more open to his claim of resurrection than the average Western postmodern human being would be. Because they were already superstitious and already had all these kind of strange beliefs. So we, it, in our way of thinking, we think, well, yeah, they believed it because they were just gullible people. And, and after all, that was kind of the way they, they lived their lives. And so they would have eagerly expected this thing to happen. The problem with that theory is that it's absolutely wrong. Because here they are, according to all the gospel accounts of the resurrection that they've been hearing, and all of them that you read about, they don't show the disciples expecting the resurrection at all. And nowadays we, we're, we're taught to think of faith as something that it, it relates inversely to to uh, reality or to uh, logic and evidence. In other words, the more facts you have, the less faith you need, right? That's kind of the, the Western way of thinking. But that isn't what the Bible means by faith. 
Faith doesn't mean hoping what isn't true. It means a certainty about what you can't see. So, I mean, if it's about the more facts I get, the more evidence I have, the less faith I need to have. No. Because this isn't about believing something impossible. It's about believing something that you can't see. Praise the Lord. Faith has a, has a significant rational component to it. Look at John, again, let's go back to John chapter 20, uh, verses 5 through 7. He, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together into, uh, unto itself, or placed by itself, together by itself. Um, he says, he stooping down and looking in, saw. Now that, that word saw is a Greek word, blepo, B-L-E-P-O. And it means not just to see, but to do what Don was talking about earlier. To ponder and to process. So you had a vision, and you just didn't see it. You saw it, but you tried to figure it out. It means something. There ought to, there's some evidence being revealed to me here, and I'm not sure what it is, and that's exactly what is being is taking place right here. He didn't just look in and see uh, a physical thing laying there. He saw it, and he starts trying to put two and two together here and try to figure out what's happened, what's going on. He's processing. He's pondering the information that he's gathering. So Peter comes in, and he's probably thinking, now look, if Jesus... Had, been, had just revived or come back to life or, or he was passed out as the Muslims and others, you know, try to say he swooned and then he, come, you know, he came to or whatever. He's, he's looking at this and he's saying, well, now, if he just came awake, if he just woke up or came to and he got up, the clothes would be all torn and, and unraveled. He would have been pulling stuff off of him and just get me out of here, right? But if friends had taken him, they wouldn't have dishonored the body by stripping it naked and then hauling it out of their nude. All of this is what he's trying to figure out and put together. And then again, if it was the enemy, if it was uh, enemies of his that did it, why would they take the clothes off and put them in a nice neat pile and fold them all up and place them here? They would have grabbed him and away they'd have went. So he's, he's thinking. He's looking for evidence and he's testing all of the possibilities that the information that he's getting here, that he's seeing, provide. But here's the deal. Faith isn't only rational. It's not just rational alone. Because you can't get all the way to real faith just through reason. It takes reason, but reason won't take you far enough. Amen? So... Even though reasoning won't get you all the way to faith, faith isn't less than rational either. Say it again. Even though reasoning won't take you to the ultimate end of faith, there's nothing irrational about faith. Unbelievers see it as irrational. It's totally rational to us as believers. We don't, we're not thinking it's insane. We're not thinking it's crazy to expect to be healed, to expect to be prospered, to expect to be saved. But rationality, just reasoning alone, won't get you to that. But it's not the absence of rationality and reason that provides it either. Why not? Because real faith is an act of the whole person. Praise the Lord. Your intellect has to be committed just as much as your will does, as much as your emotions are. 
That's why it's one thing to have a church service and people are hooping and hollering and running all over the place, but that doesn't necessarily mean that faith has been activated because you can see that same person on the street two hours later and they're right back in the dumps and depressed and, bu and bummed out and everything else. Why? Because it hasn't been the whole, the whole they didn't wholly get it. Their emotions responded to something. They, they reacted in a certain way, and that's why I don't promote emotions. I'm not against them. I got them, and, and you know, you see me get excited and cry from time to time and so forth. I'm not, I'm not saying don't. I'm just saying that's not the evidence. That's not the proof of anything. That's just a part of it. Praise the Lord. So, faith in Christ is impossible, and yet it's rational. And there's something else here that's even more important than that. That faith comes by and in grace. It comes by grace, and it's in grace that it exists. In every way, faith is grace-filled. Back to John 20, let's look at uh, verse 11 through 18 here. Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. They said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I'll take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Praise the Lord. So this, this is actually the main point of the New Testament. Amen? There, there's several places in the Old Testament where God confronts people who are seriously mistaken, who are in error, who are wayward, right? Who have done stupid stuff, right? There's Genesis 3 and 9. You don't have to go there, Mike, for the sake of time. God comes to Adam and Eve, and he says, where are you, Adam? It's not like God didn't know where he was or what he'd done. Who told you he was naked? I mean, who, who made you aware of shame? Right? He's not being mean to him. We, we religiously look at that, and we think, ah, that's God. This is just getting it. No, God was being gentle. He's saying, where are you, Adam? I mean, we're used to being together here this time of day, and where are you? He's asking him a question. He's trying to get him to do some reasoning here, to think. Same way with Jonah. You know, Jonah was obviously out of the will of God, all screwed up and messed up, and he says, I don't, I'm, I don't even want to live. I don't want to see this. I don't want these people being saved. I don't want them, you know, having a revival or anything else. And the Lord speaks to him, and he says, are you right to be angry? He says, is, is it right for you to be angry about this? He's not being mean to him. He's asking him a question, trying to get him to think. Praise the Lord. So the questions that Jesus is asking here are real similar. Why are you crying? Right? It's a wake-up call. Look, look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14. He's saying, what are you crying for? Something you're not seeing right. You're not, you're not thinking right, Mary. What are you crying for? Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light, yeah. or revelation, or understanding. Praise the Lord. Who is it you're looking for, he says. Like he doesn't know who she's looking for. He's trying to get her to... Start reasoning. Start thinking. Because why? Her estimate of Jesus is way too small. She thought he was a great teacher. She loved him and believed 
while he was there teaching that she was the Messiah. But when things kind of turned flip-flop on her, now all of a sudden, her estimate of Jesus is just, I miss him, he was a great guy. Where did they take him? That's the point Jesus is trying to get to here. Your understanding of me is way too small, Mary. You don't understand. Mary's, she misinterprets the question. She thinks he's the gardener. Right? She thinks he's asking, who are you looking for? So she says, are you the gardener? So Jesus makes another attempt to get through to her with one simple word. Mary. Look at John 10, verse 3 and 4. To him the porter openeth, that's the guy that guards the gate, right? And the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, because they know his voice. So she, she's not getting it. He's trying to get her to understand, look, you're, I, I'm, I'm way bigger than this. And now she thinks he's the gardener. So he cuts right through all of it, and he says, Mary. And immediately, she knows him. She recognizes the voice, right? And that's exactly what he does. What he did there is exactly what he does in John 20. He says, Mary, why? Because real faith is personal. That's why you can't tell me how to get my miracle. Because that's how you got your miracle. You can testify how God was faithful to you, but the, the way God speaks to you is not likely going to be the way he speaks to me. But I'll know his voice just like you knew his voice, just like you did, right? But we can't start looking at everybody and measuring the way God deals with them the way he deals with us because we're all different. It's personal. This, that's the idea of faith is personal. It's not something you can just give somebody eight steps or teach them, here's how you faith. Somehow, it, 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 something personal happens. You hear God say, march around the room. You know, you hear God say, I want you to just walk this bike path and say what I say. I can't say that's what you need to do and God will heal you. I can say that's what I did and God healed me because that's what God said to me. He, he wants it to be, I don't want to be a second-hand God to you. I don't want you to, I don't want to be Nathan's God to you. I want to be Dean's God. I want to be Jody's God. I want to be your God. I want it to be a personal thing. I want you to hear my voice. Praise the Lord. So that's what he's doing there. And Mary's running around crazy, you know. Look, look, look at here. Look at John 20, verse 16. Saith unto her, Mary... She turned herself and saith, Rabbi, which is to say, Master. It's exactly what Jesus is doing there. She's, she's flipping out. I mean, she's going berserk. She's panicking. She's scared. She's just crazy. And all the time, Jesus is hinting, giving these hints to her, and she's missing it because she's looking for the wrong Jesus. She's looking for a dead Jesus. For a Jesus far less great than he really is. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you something. She never would have found him unless he sought her. She'd still be running around screaming three days later in that garden, digging up shrubs going through the track, anything and everything, trying to find him. If he hadn't come to her and said, Mary, right here. He comes to her. And what I'm saying is, her faith comes by grace. She doesn't earn it. 
fact, she's operating against the very thing Jesus is trying to reveal to her. The scripture here isn't just telling us that grace is the cause of our faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, right? That's Jesus. But it's not just telling us that, that grace is the cause of our faith, but it's telling us that it's the content of our faith. And we make this big thing about faith. I'm not talking about what we talked about here this morning, but turn on Christian TV, read, get the books on faith and so on and so forth, and, you'll, and it's all about you. And it's not about you. You would never think to have faith if it wasn't for grace. That's why when you look at people who are not believers and you can't understand why, or people who still see Jesus as smaller than he really is, it takes Jesus to say, I'm bigger than this. I'm bigger than this disease. I'm more than this so-called death threat. I'm more than this financial crisis you're going through. I'm bigger than this. And we're going around frantic and, my God, where's Jesus in all of this mess? And he's right there saying, hey, I'm here, but I'm a lot different than what you think I am, and that's why you're having problems seeing me. I'm not dead. I'm not weak. I'm not impotent. All things are possible if you can believe. Amen? Amen? See, true Christian faith believes that Jesus saves us through the death, burial, and resurrection. And he does that so that we can be accepted by sheer grace, by grace alone. That's the gospel. That's the good news. We are saved. We are healed. We are prospered. We're made whole by the work of Jesus through grace. So faith is a gift of God. And it's built on thinking and evidence activated by God's miraculous intervention. It's not insane to believe. It's not irrational to believe. It's not stupid to believe. It's based on rational thought, on evidence, and it's motivated or instigated by the grace of God. If you don't think that's true, then you read these accounts the way they're presented, it's insane. The last person you would have wanted for a witness to the world and to everybody else is a woman in that century, in that time. They were, their, 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 their opinion wasn't even accepted in courts. They were nobodies. They were nothings. And had it not been for the fact that Jesus showed up and revealed himself over a period of 40 days, dozens of times so that people all over the place were seeing him. They had evidence. But even with all of that evidence, it still took the intervention of God's grace for people to believe it. If, if he wanted to just make it a, a believable scenario, he could have done it any way he wanted to. He could have made it to where the facts could not have been argued with, where it wouldn't have taken any real faith. It would have just taken... Well, look, here's all the evidence. We got all the information we need. It's got to be true. He even used people who others wouldn't believe so that it would still demand grace from him, intervention, miraculous intervention from God in order for anybody to believe it. So based on the, the radical discovery that Jesus has accomplished everything that we need and that we can be adopted in and accepted into God's family. And all of that is by grace. Every bit of it. When Mary heard her own name on the lips of, of Jesus, she must have felt like, I'm going to close with this. I, can't, I don't know this woman's name. I apologize. Uh, the quote. But this woman said something that I heard being said here in, in a way this morning. And it must have been kind of what Mary thought when she heard the voice of Jesus, 
when he or she's been thinking he's dead, he's nothing, I don't know, we're all starting over again, what's going to happen? And the writer wrote, I'd been my whole life a bell, but I never knew it till I was lifted up and rung. And that's what Jesus does to each and every one of us. We've been our whole life supernatural, our whole spiritual life since we've been born again. We've been this supernatural, incredibly authoritative, powerful influence, not just on other people, but over sickness and disease and, and, and every attack of the enemy. Heaven is going to be filled with, sadly, many people that are going to say, all my life I was a bell. But I didn't realize it until somebody picked me up and rang me. That's what the voice of Jesus does to us. It activates a faith that's beyond what we think we're capable of. All of a sudden, we realize we are something unique, crafted by God for a purpose. But until we activate the purpose, we never realize what it is that we are. And the only way we'll ever understand that is by the grace of God. It's his grace that miraculously intervenes into our situations and circumstances and gives us faith to believe what otherwise would be impossible. In other words, he opens our eyes so we can see what he sees instead of what the world is reporting around us. That's faith. To look at what is not and see it anyhow and declare it to the world. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So the next time the devil comes to you and starts ratting on you and ripping on you about your faith, just tell him, I got all I need. I got more than enough. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's the faith of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right. God bless everybody. Y'all are dismissed in Jesus' name. If anybody does want to stay in worship, Take it up with Mike. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Go in the faith of the Lord. Hallelujah. Expect a miracle this week.